This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today we're talking with Kenzel and Tio Fallen of Three Keys Coffee in Houston, Texas. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. And as always, I'm super excited to have you along today. I would encourage you, if you haven't done this already, go ahead and subscribe to the show. You could do so if you're watching me right now on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel at Keys to the Shop. And then you can also, of course, do this on your podcast player that is on Spotify, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you happen to be using whatever you use for your podcast. Subscribe. That's a big thing. Helps us know who's listening. And also, I would encourage you, if you love what you hear and it's helpful for you in your career, go ahead and send this to a friend. Put it up on social media. Share keys to the shop with other people. I mean, we're getting close to a thousand episodes, I want to say. I haven't checked lately. I know this is technically episode 499, but we don't number all the episodes. So it's a lot. And chances are very, very good if you are a coffee professional, a manager, trainer, owner, there's something that's going to be useful for you from all of the people we've interviewed, all the topics we've covered. So uh, you can check a lot of this out. Oh, also, by the way, over at keystotheshop.com, get plugged in there as well. Now, one of the things that I do, not only is this podcast, of course, but one of the main things I do is coaching and consultation for coffee shop owners and operators. I've even worked one-on-one with some managers as well. Basically, this is all about taking quality operations and people to the next level. And not just arbitrarily, but making sure that that next level makes sense for them. So it's not really a plug and play model. It's an in-depth coaching relationship that allows you or basically empowers you, I would say, to achieve those natural next best levels for what's going on in your business. And that could be solving major problems. That could be uh, making sure you're making the right steps on challenges that you're having or on opportunities that you have in your business as it grows. I've worked with many people over the years in new to the industry niches of coffee and then also in the niche of you are an experienced coffee shop owner, but you want to refine things. That's kind of what I do full time. So if this is something that's interesting to you and you want to work one on one with me and have keys to the shop on your side to help you refine and elevate your operations, people and quality, go ahead and email Chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. Now, you know, today's episode, of course, is got to be sponsored. And that's one of the reasons we can do what we do here. And our sponsors today are the Ground Control Brewer. You can find out more groundcontrol.coffee, as well as the Barista Series from Pacific, which is an amazing plant based performance beverage. That's over at pacificfoodservice.com. We're going to talk more about that later in the episode. But right now, I want to jump into our interview with Kenzel and Tio Fallen of Three Keys Coffee in Houston, Texas. I've been hearing so many great things about their company. It's been around since 2019 when it was founded. So this is their fifth year in business. And in that short period of time, it probably feels like a long period of time, They have uh, become a world-renowned roaster and award-winning roastery, plus they just launched their brick-and-mortar retail store, and that is going very well. Now, this whole thing, this Founder Friday, is going to explore the story of how it came to be, how it was founded, grown, and then scaled to where it is today, and all of the values and decisions behind it. Kenzel and Tio have careers in other fields, and this was really a side project. Their lives converged to create Three Keys Coffee, and they started this with the emphasis on the importance of consistency, quality, on accessibility for their coffee offerings, and there's a lot of inspiration. The name Three Keys comes from the keys on a trumpet, which Tio is proficient at as a musician, among other things. 
but they in this episode talk about the why behind what they're doing, what accessibility means to them, and the ethos behind the coffees they source and roast, and now how they have put together their retail location. And Three Keys Coffee focuses on transformational employment also. They want to develop leaders in the coffee industry as they bring people onto the team. So not only are they passionate about the business, they're obviously passionate about people. They offer roasting training to aspiring coffee professionals, and they want to grow the community. They basically want to invest so that they can continue to help others grow as Three Keys Coffee grows. And they strive to be authentic all the way through as they pursue these things with their businesses. So it was great to talk to Kenzel and Tio, consummate professionals and people who are driven by not just coffee, but the why behind the coffee, the advancement of people, care for their community. And that community not only includes Houston and those who buy their coffee online, but also the coffee community. And you're going to get a lot of inspiration as they unfold their story and the lessons they have learned along the way of running Three Keys Coffee. So I hope you're ready to hear from some award-winning, authentic, passionate coffee professionals. So let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with the founders of Three Keys Coffee, Kenzel and Tio Fallen. All right, Kenzel, Tio, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Doing great. Yeah, I've been wanting to have you all on the show for a bit. And so I'm excited to talk about this. And so many people that I know have said so many great things about your company. And I know you just started, I don't know how many months ago it was that you launched your brick and mortar, your your cafe. So that adds a whole new level of complexity to things, I'm sure. So we're going to get to that. But I'm so excited to talk to you. You know, I'm, of course, wanting to dive into the catalyst for your business as sort of like the first steps you had toward coffee as just a thing to pursue you both have different professional backgrounds and training and i'm curious if for each of you it was a different journey into coffee or was it all kind of coming together and saying we both love coffee let's do this as our full-time gig yeah so i'll take that one kenzel and i you know we've been married for a while like almost 15 years And if you think about our coffee journey and like what Three Keys represents, it's that kind of convergence of our life story. And so that's what makes it so genuine and so like and why we're so passionate about it is because it's taking the the various chapters of our lives, including like us coming together. And then it channels that into like this forming of something. Right. And so, you know, for me, there's the individual aspect of it. Right. Of like my life story dating back to my childhood, spending the first part, half of my life committed and dedicated to, you know, musicianship. And then, you know, that translating or transitioning into more of like the field of science and engineering and pursuing that as a career and eventually meeting Kenzel, starting a family and starting a business. And so Kenzel also, um, and I'll let her speak to it, obviously, but, you know, she has a life story, uh, that life element to it as well. And like chapters of her life that kind of led to this moment, right? And that convergence. And so it's almost like I mentioned the word chapters, right? Like you have these separate parts, right? And and there's a story within that chapter, but the convergence is like the the entire story, the entire book, right? And so in thinking about Kenzel's book and my book and when we met and how all of those experiences came together and then how me taking this, I or, or us and our travels and our you know, enjoyment of coffee, starting off as casual consumers to then, you know, taking that to a, a level of being you know, a bit more passionate about it, a bit more curious than, you know, me having this, you know, desire to use what I've learned through engineering and through just kind of curiosity to then apply that to coffee and her supporting that. So that's essentially what you get with Three Keys is that, you know, this culmination of the life story into us now wanting to make an impact in the community and through our experiences and and coffee is just the medium for doing so. Chris, there's something you said that is interesting. You said before we decide to go into this full time, and I actually want to clarify one thing that is really surprising to a lot of people 
is that everything that we have built thus far with Three Keys has been as a side gig for us. Tio is still working a full-time career in engineering. And I have decided to dedicate 100% to Three Keys only as of a couple of weeks ago. So um, Tio comes wow. from a background of being an engineer in the oil and gas industry and in the energy industry here in Houston. And I come from more of a consulting, corporate banking, professional background in the risk management function. Yes, everything that, that we've, we've done thus far has been our uh, side gig. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Okay. So I, and I, I want to dig into that a little bit because I, I think that's fascinating. Thank you for clarifying that. But Kenzel, with your background, what was coffee's allure for you? What, how did that happen with your story? I would say my journey was a byproduct very much of TO's as a consumer initially. And so I was not a very big coffee drinker growing up. I think a lot of people I've encountered have these stories of sharing coffee with their grandparents. And that's actually specifically what Teal's story is. I was not one of those where I really started drinking, which is probably a lot of people with Starbucks as an adult. And so Teal was the one who started to be a little bit more intrigued by the craft coffee space. So then that's when we started exploring more specialty coffee shops. But I would say that the part in which I became completely sold as an individual about specialty coffee was one, learning more about the origin story and tracing its roots to Ethiopia. It's, you know, it's controversial. Where is it Ethiopia? Is it, I think, uh, you know, even um, Sudan stakes some claim, but in, to Africa and knowing that it originated from the continent of Africa. And then also when Teal started to try to do some roasting at home and exploring things and I being able to taste flavors from coffee that I never knew could exist from a cup of coffee. That's when I became a lot more intrigued by that. And so then when we would go on different travels, if they were to coffee producing regions, we always threw in some sort of coffee farm stop into the tour. Yeah. So, you know, or not tour, but into the experience. So we went to Costa Rica, we stopped at, you know, made sure to incorporate coffee farms. We went to Bali, made sure to incorporate coffee tasting in that. And so for me, it was about the way to experience the world <laughs> through coffee. Wow. And so then both of your individual stories about you know, hey, this is something we both really love. Eventually, it became something you pursued. Now, it won't say full time, but now it's a side hustle, which you could have just continued to be people who enjoyed coffee and enjoyed the best coffee, right? But now you, you mentioned the roasting part, and that was, it sounds like it was a hobby the, to try to get deeper into it. So you were like the coffee nerd classic story, home roasting, right? So at what point did that turn from hobby to, you know, I think it should probably sell this coffee to people. <laughs> I'm not really sure when that switch happened, but, you know, I could trace it back to a point in time where, you know, I was like, you know, met with a group of guys. Uh, we we're kind of talking about opening up a cafe. And so at that point, I started digging into like, all right, what is that? You know, the coffee economics, right? What makes a shop? operate, what makes it tick and kind of understanding the cost of a cup of coffee, you know, for lack of better words. And so during that sort of evaluative process, you know, I was like, hey, like this roasting thing can be a business in its own, right? And honestly, do I really want to operate a cafe? Like, or do I just like the idea of operating a cafe? Like what I really enjoy is roasting coffee, right? So could that be the business? And so I think that really became the catalyst for me to kind of strike out on my own path. And I mentioned Kenzel's story because she has coming from the banking industry, coming from risk management, but she's also, she's very savvy. And I, you know, I could put something in front of her and she can analyze it, right. And kind of weigh out the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of an idea and really create the template or the roadmap for how we could make this a thing. How we're not just like, not just going to be just on the hamster wheel, so to speak, doing, for lack of better words, like kind of stuck in the, the market circuit. How can we kind of take this beyond that and have the most impact, right? And, and make this the most meaningful. Yeah. My um, perspective is I consider myself a maximizer. 
Gio is, he comes up with a lot of the ideas. I figure out how do we execute that in a way that we're maximizing the potential impact, the potential benefit to our team, to our customers. And so um, I think initially we thought maybe it will be a fun, you know, we'll do farmers markets on the weekend sort of thing. But Tio and I are very high capacity, high performing, and also have a lot of expectations for ourselves. And so another motto I I like to use is how you do anything is how you do everything. And so we were like, well, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. You know, making sure that the branding really reflected something that was a unique voice in the industry, making sure that the quality of our coffee was, you know, top notch. And a lot of that led to Trader Joe's reaching out to us in, I think we had only been in business for four months at that point and making sales and then wanted to have us on, on the shelf. So we ended up on the shelves of 43 Trader Joe's in our first year of business. And then that just continued to expand. Another surprising thing is that when we launched our website, we also ended up being featured by Sprudge within the same week. So whereas, you know, a lot of times with the early stages of a business, all of your sales are friends and family, our first stranger sale was actually with our first week of launching our business because of the publicity from the Sprudge feature that we had received. And and, and there's more to that than that I want to elaborate on because the Sprudge thing, right? There's uh, audacity that was at play with that, right? Because you know, me, I'm kind of totally in imposter syndrome right now. And I'm like, ah, is this going to, is this even good enough? Like, is this, you know, hundred percent imposter syndrome. Kenzel's like, I have the audacity to reach out to Sprudge and say, Hey, we're this new roaster in, in Houston. You should feature us. Right. <laughs> and so we complement each other that way. And Kenzel mentioned just how we landed in Trader Joe's. And part of that was, you know, equal parts honing in on the roasting, the craft itself. But I spent a lot of time just conceptualizing the brand, right? What story I wanted to convey. And so when we finally like turned the lights on to the website and we finally, you know, sold our first bag, it looked like we had been around for years, Mm. right? Because it was such a mature concept, right? So before we even sold our first bag, I was maturing the concept of what Three Keys the story of Three Keys and what I envisioned of it and and how that would, you know, portray to the consumer. Tell me about that then. What is the story that you're conveying? For me, Three Keys is essentially elevating the familiar, right? So the familiarity of coffee, the nostalgia of coffee, the story of having that first cup of coffee with your grandparents and just elevating that, right? And so making that experience familiar, but also unique. And that's why we, you know, lean into some classic profiles, right? So there's a trend in third wave coffee of like veering away from dark roast, right? Whereas we'll, we'll lean into it. We'll lean into that classic Brazilian dark roast profile or the classic Colombian profile, but in an elevated way, because now we are, because of how we focus on the sourcing and how we focus on the craft of roasting, I'm not just going to roast it dark just for it to be dark. I'm going to roast it to a dark roast that preserves some acidity, that takes some of that burnt quality off, but also imparts the chocolatey, the nutty profiles that you expect from a dark roast. So it's it's really that, you know, again, you know, the sense of that nostalgia. And that's why we pick jazz, right? Jazz is like a very nostalgic. When you think of the music, it takes you to a moment, right? Whether that's in your living room, you know, whether that's remembering a record, you know, or remembering what you heard in a live cafe. And I want to draw those similar experiences and parallels with the coffee. Three Keys Coffee, the name comes from the valves of the trumpet that Tio played as a child all the way through college. He played for a really renowned band, the Florida A&M Marching 100 and HBCU band communities. Definitely have an understanding and appreciation for that craft of the art of uh, that sound, the trumpet sound. And so when creating Three Keys, we wanted to have that personal connection associated with it in terms of the music and the creativity that we wanted to invoke and inspire through our coffee. Yeah. So we wanted to create a multi-sensory experience for each one of our roasts. We have a curated playlist 
that corresponds to each one of those that's available on Spotify and Apple Music. And so, um, and eventually we ended up putting a QR code on our packaging on the bag so that you can scan to it and then experience the mood and the vibe that we wanted to create to match what that experience was in terms of tasting the coffee. So take, for example, we have a product that's called Congo Square. It's first of all sourced from DRC, Dominican, uh, sorry, Democratic Democratic. Republic of Congo. Um, And then it's named after the square in New Orleans, which was considered the birthplace of jazz. So during slavery on Sundays, slaves were allowed one afternoon of freedom in which they could go to the square and create music, take their drums, take their instruments, use their bodies as instruments and create music and for a very fleeting time, feel free. And so the playlist that corresponds to that one, that coffee is very, it's, um, you know, New Orleans second line jazz, it's vibrant, it's lively, and but also very poignant just to represent that entire story that we wanted to tell through that coffee. I imagine there's a lot of people that you've inspired with that part of the story as well as you've been operating and gaining notoriety. Uh, it's so great to see that the brand got taken up so quickly to spread that connection to you know the familiar but also the mission the message behind it yeah yeah for sure you know one thing to touch on because uh Kenzel mentioned my background you know playing trumpet or whatnot and so i mentioned like the chapters right the chapters in life and so for me it's a uh, very thoughtful of like does that chapter connect to the next chapter or is it just a standalone chapter right and so for me, it was like I spent all this time, you know, with this trumpet. My first trumpet was gifted to me by my grandfather when I was in like third grade. So I spent all this time and it's like, do I just close that chapter and then not lead to anything else? You know, like all that time spent, that time on task, the dedication, the commitment. What was the meaning? What was the purpose behind that? And so with this following chapter being three keys and being the coffee company, it just kind of completes that narrative, completes that story. I like how it's integrated that whole of who you are. And that's what people say instruments are anyway. I'm a guitar player and uh, I spent some time playing the clarinet in high school. You know, you get good enough on something because you learn the ins and outs of it that eventually you're not thinking about the tempo or the technical stuff. You're thinking about expression. So I'm kind of curious about that journey from, you know, you're adept at lots of different disciplines in life and you've become able to improvise and be creative within those disciplines, taking on coffee and learning roasting and learning to be consistent as well as creative. How did it come about where you started to really feel like it's not just that we're improvising, we're being creative, but we're being very consistent and we are indeed putting out something that is on the level of the best roasters out there. Roasting for me just so happened to be like a great complement of like the artisanal side, but also the the complementary science, right? And so my background in engineering actually helped me to understand the science of roasting better. I was able to understand time, temperature, heat transfer, how all of those things are at play when you're roasting for consistency and roasting for a consistent profile. And again, it's, it was familiar. I'm like, hey, I'm they're talking about this rate of rise, like, yeah, that's just like a derivative of temperature over time, you know? So I'm able to like kind of process it in real time based on all the years of study of just other applications of of thermodynamics. So yeah, I think that's what's what's helped me a lot and why I'm very particular about the consistency and why I'm very particular about the quality and understanding how these sorts of variables impact the flavor and the quality of the coffee, right? So like, what are the you know, parameters and the boundaries in which you start to notice differences, right? And so once you understand that, you can start defining that and you can build a program around those definitions and and around those concepts. We also wanted to validate that through third party or objective or independent means of confirming that. So a few things that assisted in that. So one, we um, sent some of our coffees off to be reviewed by Coffee Review as per their editorial schedule, getting that independent assessment. And I think as of now, we have four that have scored 92 or more. And a couple of those were our first year. So that was like an external independent validation. It's also been through, Tio and I both became curators 
I wanted to personally pursue that because I was having a lot of challenges with um, having serious conversations with importers or getting them to take me seriously. I think being a newcomer, we were we were getting, I'm just going to be blunt, we would get some like crack coffee or it would be very different from what the expectations were. And I remember distinctly having a conversation and complaining about a particular bag of Sumatra that we had received that was just riddled with defects and bug damage galore. And I was told, I'll never forget this. They were like, well, you do understand that coffee is an agricultural product, right? Yeah. And the level <laughs> of dis- disrespect that we felt. So I said, you know what? Okay. In this industry, it seems respected to be a Q grader. And maybe that's what we need in order for people to <laughs> know that we have done our research and we are serious about this. And so we went and pursued the Q, you know, as again, independent confirmation of what we felt, you know, in terms of how we assess quality and source. But then it's also lastly through competitions. Actually, TO's very first experience with competition was actually through um, Glitter Cat Barista. It was during the pandemic and they had the digital competition and T.O. had placed first. And um, it was it was it was fun, but it was also um, a way to really kind of dip his toes into thinking about, well, what is competition like? And so then when, you know, it came back to the USRC circuit pursuing that. And so uh, his best finishes thus far. um, So this year he had placed fifth last year, ninth in the U.S. for the finals. But yes, but continuing to challenge himself and put himself out there to really put to the test, like, what are my capabilities as a roaster? You know, can I back up? Can I, can I, can I walk, walk the walk and back up what I'm, what I'm saying, right? And so those were, I think, the ways that along the, along the journey, we made sure that it wasn't just us voices in our own heads, that we were making sure that we were getting that independently assessed and evaluated by others as well. Yeah, let me, I want to ask about that because there is a certain kind of allure and I think what you did is amazing and it's something people should do. And we have recommendations from lots of professionals on the show that say, Hey, you should be drinking other people's coffee too, and seeing how things taste across the industry. And then there's the balance of saying, okay, well, that's good and useful information to give us a, a picture into different facets of how we are perceived from outside of our own heads. But then there's the taking back of the autonomy and the, okay, that's cool. Now I'm going to do what I want to do without feeling too worried or paranoid about what the industry is going to think about it. How do you balance doing things the three keys way while also receiving feedback from not only your customers, but your peers in a healthy way. So it doesn't derail you. I hope that makes sense. It does. And I think that for us, we have realized that you will never and can never please everyone. And that that's okay, because we're all unique. We all have different palates. We've had roasts that roasted the very same way. You get two different people. One person says, this is way too light for me. The other person says, this is way too dark for me. You know, there's that preference. Or we have some where people say, this is the best coffee that I've ever tried. And others like, "Ah, that's not really my cup of tea. I mean, that's the beauty of us having different palettes and perspectives. And that's, and if I, if I spent my time trying to chase everyone's everyone's preferences, we would be spinning our wheels endlessly going nowhere. Um, And so I think that we've just, we've embraced that what we try to do is to create products that have range and that can essentially just be an accessible way for people to have high quality specialty coffee um, in an approachable format and to know that everybody's going to have a different opinion. Yeah, but if you have range, then you know that there's something in the lineup that fits those preferences, right? And so that's why we focus on that. We focus on the range and the quality. And like Kenzel mentioned, accessibility, making sure that our coffee can be consumed. Again, I mentioned my grandparents, right? Like I want that coffee to be accessible to them, right? And so if that means that we lean more into grocery retail, you know, that's what we're going to do because that was our mission. Elevate the familiar and make it accessible. Well, hey, everyone, it's Chris, and we'll be right back with our interview with the founders of Three Keys Coffee. But I did want to talk to you about our sponsors today, beginning with the Ground Control Brewer. 
You can find out more at the Ground Control website, groundcontrol.coffee. Their new brewer, now I say new because the Cyclops brewer, the original, the award-winning, both in design and function, has been making the rounds around the world, literally helping elevate coffee quality and productivity behind the bar. The new brewer has a 30% higher output of concentrates for espresso and cold brew because this machine is not just a next level batch brewer, but it also makes batch iced lattes, batch cold brew. So you can see why the productivity aspect of this is so important for a cafe. And that 30% higher output comes in a smaller package. So it's not as tall as the Cyclops. It actually fits in more places in your cafe. So check them out at groundcontrol.coffee for more information about this brewer and see if this is the right fit for you. It's definitely a conversation piece. It is an elevation in quality and productivity and is all around a great thing to explore if you're looking to stand out in the marketplace. Go ahead and visit again over at groundcontrol.coffee. Now, our other sponsor today is our friends over at Pacific, and they have a product. You might know it. You might be using it. It is the Barista Series from Pacific. This is the line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed for baristas, and they are tested by world-class baristas before they reach your shelves. Taking the heat from steaming is a big thing. It stands up to the heat. It also creates amazing texture for latte art. It has a great balance of flavor, so the coffee is always the star. And all of those combined with the fact that Pacific has historically been such a supporter of the coffee community and baristas in particular makes this product something you have to try. Go ahead and visit pacificfoodservice.com and get samples and try it for yourself. If you're looking for the best in plant-based beverages, then I think you should be thinking of the barista series from Pacific. So let's get right back to our conversation now with the founders of Three Keys Coffee, Kenzel and Tio Fallon. Can I ask about your categories? There's the grocery store. There's like, I want my grandma to be able to drink this and and enjoy it. There's a lot of different ways you can divide your potential customer base. How does that break down for you so that you know within these areas, I guess, we have range. What does range mean for you specifically? Range for me specifically is fundamentally, it's the range and roast level. And then it's the range in geographic representation. I'll look at our, our program like it's a portfolio. And so I'm like, hey, we have way too many Columbias, right? And we don't have any representation from Asia Pacific. Or I'm saying like, man, there's a lot of washed coffees or, you know, we don't we don't have any naturals right now. Or we don't have a, a just a wild card anaerobic. And so that's kind of what I mean by range, right? Just kind of looking at it, making sure there's balance across the geographic parameters, but also balance across the roast level parameters. And if you do that, what I would say is we take a lot of pride in the upfront due diligence of finding diamonds in the rough type coffees, right? So we can make things accessible by finding the diamonds in the rough and then pricing it accordingly so that we're not pricing people out, right? Or you can have a really solid quality bag of coffee sitting on the shelf of Trader Joe's and it's beneficial to me as a business owner where I'm, you know, I can be profitable by doing so, but it's also beneficial to the consumer because it's like the best bag of coffee on that Trader Joe's shelf and it's only $10. Mm. Okay. Got it. And giving people options and giving them accessibility, like you mentioned to that product. And, um, and I imagine there's a range of prices also it's necessary to be able to stay in business. So it's not just, it's not taking a hit just for taking a hit sake, but it's having something that I guess you could call it a loss leader. Some coffee shops really like having a $2 cup of coffee on their menu because they just want everyone to have a cup of coffee. And so what I hear you saying is that there's kind of a range that gives people options at a lower price point, and then there's higher price point coffees, but there's variety within those options. Yeah. And with that, you keep them within the, you know, three keys ecosystem, right? So if I have all of that range, there's no need to kind of explore elsewhere. You can stay within three keys and experience all of that. Nice. Love it. So here we are talking about a very personal way of approaching something that you want to be familiar to people and you're translating your skills as individuals collectively to three keys. 
you're roasting coffee, you're good at roasting coffee, but now you've got to hire people and work with people to do the same thing. And I'm curious about how that took place at first to bring people in, to train them to do things, how different it was from working just one to the other and with coffee, going from that more of an intimate beginning to a collective reality. We have very high standards when it comes to identifying people to add to our team. We are not a place to come, you know, with, you know, no experience. And I won't say that we won't consider someone who doesn't have coffee experience, but what we typically are looking for is a drive to succeed. We're looking for the passion that is required to really commit oneself because as I said, you know, quality is paramount to us. And so one thing that became a running saying within our team and also as we're identifying people is that being at three keys is intended to be transformational, not transactional. So if people were ever to come to us just seeking a job, just seeking, you know, a paycheck and just a place to be, we are not that place. What we do seek to do is to really develop and grow thought leaders in the coffee industry, whether that's with roasting, whether that's with our cafe operations or in some other space. This summer, we actually launched a roasting training cohort and because it's our first time around and we're working out some of the kinks for that, <laughs> we decided to offer it completely free. And so we have a group of six people that have spent this entire summer, it's been 12 weeks. We had some hiccups from the hurricane and holidays and things that set us back. But we have two people in there who are developing coffee concepts of their own or either already have existing small coffee businesses, and they are seeking to deepen their understanding. And we're using our space and our knowledge and, and, and access to resources to offer up what was what we had to figure out the hard way right, right. <laughs> and gather through trial and error a lot of times and wanting to help nurture them and whatever their aspirations might be. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and through that, actually, we actually recently hired one of the, <laughs> the roasting trainees to be a part of our team. Nice. And so I would say the same concept goes for any of the stakeholders that we, you know, align with, whether it's like our partners in terms of sourcing or people who join our, our team, you know, you really just got to have a true dedication to the coffee industry, to being excellent to really wanting to learn and again be transformational and transform their trajectory and not just look at this as a transaction perfect let me then ask what it is that it looks like on your end to cultivate and nurture that pursuit of excellence in transformational employment what is being a boss of that kind of a group of people uh, look like we really try to take care of our employees, and I would say almost to a fault um, of how accommodating and flexible that we are in terms of scheduling. They set their own schedules. We offer healthcare benefits because we wanted to make sure. I, I'm always saying that you know we need everyone to bring their entire best selves to work, and if they are not whole, whether that be mentally or physically then they are no good to me <laughs> or to the, to the company or to our customers. You know, recently deciding to cover healthcare benefits and not even just for the employee, but for dependents um, was something that was really important to us. And it's also through uh, paid training opportunities. Dio had recently connected with La Marzocco and brought some of our team to their site outside of Houston to do equipment tech training, which was pay training for those employees. But we also encourage them, we'll share different webinars and resources and things that we come across and letting them know that they can log training time as paid time. Those are all just some of the things in which we try to do um, to make sure that we are attracting and retaining the absolute best talent. And so then that takes another turn when it comes to the thing that you said earlier, Tio, which is, do I really want to run a cafe? 
And here you are all these years later. Now you have a cafe. How long has it been since the cafe launched and how is it going? So we launched the cafe last May. Yeah. So it's been a little bit over a year. Mm -hmm. It's going really well. We still have a few of the folks who were our original crew and they actually, in a couple of those instances, they were working with us at the roastery before um, then dedicating to our cafe. We like to make sure that the people we have on staff are cross-trained and that they can, where possible, go back and forth between the roastery and the cafe. That helps us. It's a more knowledgeable barista. Exactly. Right? Because they you have a barista. The coffee, they understand the roasting process. And who possibly even roasted the coffee themselves in a couple, in some cases, in some instances. Yeah. <laughs> that provides yeah. a little bit more of a better experience for our customers too when they have questions. I think this particular arrangement, I we never would have. This how do I put it? Kind of fell in our lap. It fell in our. And it was a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not something we didn't seek it out, and the barrier to entry was low, and so it turned out to be a really good opportunity for us, and and it allowed us to have the visibility and the space to showcase our coffees, you know, in, in the way that we would, you know, want to showcase them. So it's, it's worked out well in that, in that sense. And it's kind of given us the, you know, proof of concept for like future expansion, right. To, to expand our brick and mortar presence and eventually like really create that, that flagship, you know, three key space. Yeah. And to elaborate a little bit on when Tio says, you know, really great opportunity. So it's a part of a food hall, so we benefit from being a part of this ecosystem. Um, it's also located within a business complex. And so you, you benefit from having a lot of the foot traffic from different businesses in the downtown Houston area. And so our space is located. It's actually within where the Chase Bank, most of their operations are. And it's right on a train line. And so then we benefit from, you know, having having that that traffic. One of our biggest weekends ever was college, college football, football championship, championship. Yeah. was here in Houston. And Tio is a Michigan alum. And so we did a lot of pubbing beforehand to say, hey, there's a Michigan owned shop right on the train line to the energy stadium. Hop over here before you head to the game. And it was an insane weekend. <laughs> yeah. Tio even ended up getting featured in the alumni on their Instagram page. You got an interview for it was like it just was a really um, wild weekend. So we've benefited from having a very strategic location as well for that, you know, inaugural or first concept. That's great. That's awesome. And so I'm curious because you've got such momentum with your business before the cafe. And then this was a thing like, okay, twist our arm. It's a great deal. We're going to do it. And you now talk about it in terms that sound like this was a good decision. And it's something that we want to pursue even more now to have that HQ, to have what, you know, the, that presence, has it really shown a promise for pushing wholesale for uh, repping the brand very well to the public. It, I mean, it sounds like it's been doing some great things for your business. And I think a lot of roasters really wonder that about having a retail expression. So tell me a little bit more about this past year and how it's been an asset. I think for us and, and our story might be a little unique in this and that, you know, recall we launched on an online platform during the pandemic and so we were sending product to other states more than we were sending anything locally. So we ended up growing more nationally than locally. I'll have to check, but I know the last time I, I looked, um, over 85% of our sales were outside of the city of Houston and over six, yeah, 65% or so were outside of the state of Texas. So the shop for us allowed us to have start to build more on the local Houston presence and connecting more with our community on the ground. I think with, you know, brick and mortars are a way to have a tangible connection with your customer that you can't get through an online presence. And so those have been ways that have just kind of, you know, helped to build our um, understanding of what our customer is looking for and also in how effectively we are conveying what we're seeking to convey through our coffee and company. 
and just to add to that from the pure kind of business economic levers that are at play. The cafe has offered just a very stable cash flow generating part of the business. Whereas the roastery, if you think about wholesale and you think about like grocery or what have you, where let's say I'm buying, you know, coffee to fulfill an order, I have to then roast that coffee, I have to then ship it. And then I have to wait another 60 days, you know, or 45 days because the the terms are net 40 or net, you know, net 45 or net 60 or what have you. So there's a huge upfront investment just to for the green coffee. And then to turn around to like generate revenue from that could be like two months later. Right. And so whereas with the cafe, you know, if I buy a gallon of milk, I probably consume that and, you know, generated the revenue off of that in two days. So it helps kind of stabilize in in that sense. If you can really kind of get into the numbers of, you know, what's the cost, what what are your COGS, what are your, you know, your your payroll labor ratios and really kind of fine tune that so that you're generating positive cash flow and it's also that stable cash flow. Yeah. And I mean another another thing to think about too is that, you know, if all of all of my roastery customers you know, bailed on us, then hopefully that never happens. But I can guarantee having at least one wholesale account, and that is my own, (laughs) which is the shop. And so um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we know that the roastery is supplying for the shop itself and and thinking about, again, the economics of, you know, wanting to expand maybe from a roastery to a, to a cafe help to kind of make make a little bit more sense there. Yeah, it gives you some financial range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Good. As we wrap here, I, I'd love to know your advice really to other people. I'm sure you talk to a lot of whether they're wholesale clients or just people in the industry who are inspired by what you do and want to begin a side hustle that grows to the, the level that you're doing right now. What is your advice to them and how they can best manage their energy and attention and really maximize that first step? My advice would be always to understand your why. It's what you will have to keep coming back to when it gets really tough and you want to just give it all up (laughs) and close up shop. You have to keep going back to what your why was and staying true to that. Authenticity shows no matter what the concept or the business, customers can pick up on when anything feels inauthentic and it will carry over into so many other aspects of the operation, the way that you hire, the way that you treat your employees, the way that you treat your customers, the way that you interact with your suppliers. It's really important to have a very sincere commitment and to always know why you're doing something. Tio and I are parents, we have three children And so I know that it's very important for us. I mean, we have lots of whys, right? (laughs) But, you know, it's important to show to them what you can build through hard work and intelligence and having great networks and communications and relationships with people. And so a lot of our children are a big part of our why. And so, yeah, everybody is going to have a different a different reason. But I think if at any point what you're doing in your business is in conflict with that, then that's when, you know, you need to kind of reel some things in and evaluate, you know, am I really going in the direction that matches where I want to be and, and why I want to be there? That's really hard to do if it means sacrificing something that is working for itself, but not working for your why. I guess if you take a financial hit to say, I'm not going to go ahead with that opportunity to work with this company, or I'm not going to scale my business in this way at this time because it goes against some of our values. And we've done that. Those have been decisions that we've made that it's not the right time, Mm -hmm. right? We've said no to a lot of things. But one thing we hadn't talked about, and I want to attribute a lot to, I was on a very heavy grant grind and grants um, offset a lot of our startup expenses. I'm happy to share. We've um, at this point now received close to around $400,000 in grant funding over the course of us being in business through over 18 different sources. 
I would never recommend that someone make financially unsound decisions in a pursuit of, <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a passion. That's where you have to have a great balance of the reason and the logic against the feeling and the emotion and making sure that that's driven through practical decision making. But that's also, I don't know, my, my risk management background and being risk averse <laughs> and not wanting to bite off more than we can yeah. chew. And, and, and I guess I would encourage folks to be considerate of where they are applying their energy. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, you have to have great worth ethic. Building a business takes an immense amount of tenacity and grit and commitment. And a lot of that are things that I've learned early on that, again, I mentioned, you know, just chapters in my life that ultimately converge to what we're doing now. But with that said, you can have great worth ethic, but if you're channeling that energy towards something that's not the optimal place, you know, it it, it can become just an unnecessary grind. Yeah. So, you know, we're big on efficiency and processes, right? The, The sooner you can develop processes, the sooner you can, you know, develop decision trees, right? The sooner you can think about efficiency, efficient ways of working, that helps to ensure that that energy that you have isn't being channeled into in, in a reactive state, mm. which requires more energy when you're reactive versus being proactive, right? You know, some, sometimes that's hard to wrap, or wrap your head around because sometimes those are abstract concepts and, and Creating something requires much more work than like the doing something. Right. And so I would encourage folks like, you know, you can have great at work ethic, but if it's in wrong direction, it's, it's not helpful. And you're going to feel like you're on a hamster wheel. I use this analogy, Kinsel and I, we talk about like this process, almost look at it as like, we are trying to obtain our PhD in coffee. (laughs) <laughs> right. And so nice. that is a, you know, potentially an eight to 10 year process. Right. And so we've hit year four, we've gotten our bachelor's degree. Right. And so as we look back on the past four years, can we say that it was worth it? Right. That we weren't just in college taking classes that we weren't just, you know, going to class, just a student, a career student. Right. Have we, do we have something to show for it? Right. And so a few years from now, when it's year six or seven and, it's like, hey, did we get that master's degree? What do we have to show for it, right? Like, so that time spent, did our trajectory change or did it just flatline? Because those are real decisions that you have to make, right? Like, what are we, you have to look under the hood and determine, like, am I taking the right classes? What am I doing wrong, right? Or are there things I need to improve to make sure that trajectory is still increasing, right? And so by year eight or 10, we have to look and say, like, hey, we've spent this much time. Was it worth it? Did we earn that PhD and is it reflective of where our business is at that state? Well said. And it sounds like part of the management of your energy is to invest some of that energy into what you just described, which is taking perspective and getting perspective on what you are doing, not just doing it and doing it, but examining it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's wonderful. This is such a great conversation. I'm, I'm so glad to have you both on the show. Where can we learn more? about three keys and then kind of a a wild card question. I don't know if you can answer this, but there's three bars underneath the words, three keys, coffee. If you played those on the trumpet, what note would that be? So uh, I would say that would be the, it's the be be natural. Mm. I say that and it's kind of tongue in cheek because I'm saying like, be authentic, be your authentic self, (sighs) right? I'm so glad you brought it there. I was like, that, yes, <laughs> be natural. So don't be too flat. Don't be, just be natural. Like bring your authentic, natural self to in whatever space you're in. Thank you for that. I never knew that. Or I would have asked you to make it be sharp because I'm the one that's- Be sharp and attentive. <laughs> I prefer the, the sharp. Anyway, you had said where to, where to find us. We're still in Trader Joe's. It's mostly the South Central U.S., so there's about nine states. It's basically from like New Mexico, New Mexico over yeah. to like Alabama Tennessee, and yeah. up to Denver and over to Tennessee. So that like South Central region. And then we are in Houston area, Whole Foods. And as of probably about two weeks from now, we'll be in 120 Walmart locations in Texas. Nice. Tried and true would be three key, our website, threekeyscoffee.com. We're also active on all of our social media 
and we personally respond to those. We, we have not arrived to a point of having a social media manager. So <laughs> when you get our social media accounts and even our email correspondence, that's still coming directly from, from us. So, yeah. Excellent. Kenzel Tio, thank you so much again. It was really thank great you. to talk with you. One last bit of advice Ooh. as an owner, <laughs> you cannot be afraid to roll your sleeves up and get in there. One thing that we, you know, pride ourselves on is we won't ask anyone to do anything that we wouldn't do ourselves. Mm. Right. And we've shown that. Right. And so I think that's really important as you grow, that you still stay connected even to like the production line, right. On up. Right. And so I mean, you can find me here on a weekend bag and coffee boxing up pallets, right? And that just shows like that I'm committed to, to the grind, you know, all the way to the end, wherever that takes us. That makes a huge difference. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, everyone. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation and a huge thank you to Kenzel and Tio for being on the show. I absolutely love their heart for the business, the science, the high standards, and the heart for people and community, all synthesized in this package of a business. It's a great platform and vehicle for change and care. With great coffee, it is awesome to see their success. Again, thank you very much to you both for sharing your wisdom and being here on Keys to the Shop. It means a lot. So if you're interested in tasting their coffee or learning more about three keys and visiting their shop and all of the above, right? Go to their website, threekeyscoffee.com. That's an easy website to go to. Three, spell it out, T-H-R-E-E, threekeyscoffee.com and check out what they have to offer. I, uh, interacting with their business, I think, is the next step to just continue this conversation, but do so with their coffee in your cup. Okay, so threekeyscoffee.com and also follow them on Instagram as well. And you can find the link in the show notes for all of these things. And I also want to make sure you know that one of the things I, I mentioned, I said community and the coffee community is huge. And we use that word community because we have a common experience. Our common experience is we're working in coffee and we need encouragement, but we also need insights. We need to know about products and a business. We need to become better as we go and grow ourselves and our businesses. Coffee Fest trade shows over at coffeefest.com have been providing this opportunity for 30 plus years. And they're going to be coming to Minneapolis very soon in October. I think it's the second week of October, but also four more cities in 2025. Go to coffeefest.com and check them out because it's not just a trade show where you can interact with really amazing vendors, which is a huge draw, but it's also a place where you can be plugged into free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, discussions, and lectures and things like that. I offer at least three or four of these every show. I'm at Coffee Fest every time it's at a city. I'll be in Minneapolis next year, New York, etc. So check it out over at coffeefest.com. Get registered today and invest in yourself, invest in your business and become a better professional over at coffeefest.com. So with that, that is the end of the show. If you're interested in working with a coach, with somebody who is going to help you and consult you on how to succeed in the world of specialty coffee shops, that is what I do full time. And I'd love to chat with you and, and see how I can help you. Just email me, chris at keys to the shop.com and we'll schedule a time to jump on a Zoom call. We'll have a conversation. We'll get to know one another and see if this is the right fit. And maybe I'll be even be able to help you with what it is you're going through at the moment. But at least let's have a conversation. So again, reach out chris at keys to the shop.com. And that's it. That's it for our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe, share these shows online. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>